Good morning, everybody. Um, just to welcome you to the first rheumatology section webinar, um, we're going to be covering uh, drugs which are normally used for rheumatic diseases and which are being repurposed or investigated for use in COVID-19. Um, we've invited David Eisenberg, Professor Eisenberg, who is the Versus Arthritis Professor at UCL, to come along and speak about, first of all, the drugs which are used um, in everyday inflammatory arthritis, and whether we've changed our pattern of use in today's environment. Uh, secondly, Professor Eisenberg is going to talk about the drugs which have been repurposed or are in trials which are in rheumatology use already, why they are being used and how they're being used, the evidence behind it. So just waiting for Professor Eisenberg to unmute on his computer. So it looks like that's happening. Good morning, David. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. I've just introduced you. Um, so uh, we, we're going to talk about the drugs which are already in use in rheumatoid arthritis and other connective tissue diseases and how our practices changed by the advent of COVID, uh, bearing in mind a lot of them may be immune suppressive, uh, may have, some of them may not be. So it's just to give an overview of sure. dangers, practice, uh, how we approach it now, acute inflammatory arthritis and how we treat it. Okay, thanks. I, I can't help but uh, I can't resist starting with a little perspective. Uh, I was chatting yesterday to uh, a GP, a retired GP, who's the father, very old friend of mine, and this guy is going to be 103 in uh, in October, and he said he finds it quite remarkable. His life has his whole life has been bookended by the the Spanish flu of you know, 1917, uh, 18, uh, 19, and now this pandemic uh, uh, on this occasion. He said it's like I've been living in a history book. I said, well, I think we will be a little bit like that. So, as rheumatologists, we face some very key questions as to whether or not we should be continuing drugs like steroids and immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, you know, how dangerous are they for our patients? I, I get a lot of phone calls from patients, I, like most people, I guess, doing clinics uh, on the phone now. And some of them are very keen to stop their steroids, to stop their biologic drugs, to stop their immunosuppressive drugs. They're certainly not very keen on coming to hospital anymore. And that's another big issue with regard to blood tests. So it's, it's very tricky. I think we, there is a general agreement that patients should not be stopping uh, their immunosuppression if that's what they're on, because there is a concern their disease will flare. And we've certainly seen that at uh, UCH in the last couple of weeks. Uh, last week, we had, I had six patients, six lupus patients, who clearly had avoided coming to hospital because they were very worried about coming into hospitals. Uh, their disease was getting worse. Uh, they were trying to cut down on the immunosuppression, which was clearly a mistake. Uh, and two of them ended up in the intensive care unit and, and nothing to do with, with COVID infections incidentally. So I think it's sensible clearly from the prednisolone point of view to try to minimize the dose. Michelle Petrie's work in Baltimore indicates that six milligrams per day is the kind of the cutoff. I think if you can keep to six or less, that would be very helpful. But uh, the, the flare of disease becomes a great worry if you start um, stopping your, uh, you know, your immunosuppression. The other problem that we also have is what to do about starting drugs, where you've got patients presenting with acute rheumatoid, acute psoriatic arthritis, acute lupus. You know, how sensible is it to be putting patients onto powerful drugs at this time? And clearly there's going to be a balance here. Uh, I would advocate that where it is feasible, uh, it is better to put patients on drugs like steroids and hydroxychloroquine, perhaps ofazalazine, where the need for blood test monitoring is not as great as it would be with azathioprine, methotrexate, mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide, for example. So our, our philosophy has been to encourage patients to stay on, on the drugs that they have been on often for some months or years to manage their rheumatoid, their psoriatic arthritis, uh, their GCA, their lupus, etc. Uh, you know, it would be nice if they can reduce the steroids a little bit, but that may not be possible. But to be cautious about starting patients on large doses of steroids or immunosuppression of the more powerful drugs where you can't do the blood tests. So I think that's, the, that's my answer. 
The other okay. issue, just to touch base on our perspective, yeah. is, is the question of blood tests. Mm. Uh, as I said, a lot of patients have made it clear they don't want to come to hospital. Uh, and I've spoken to several GPs, as you probably have in the last week or two, and it's, it's, it's very clear that um, uh, what they are doing uh, is, uh, is rather variable. Some patients offer a service uh, within, their, uh, within their surgeries uh, on a timed basis. Uh, one GP told me he's actually set up a, a, a kind of... Uh, uh, a bleeding station just outside the practice so patients actually don't have to come inside they can have the blood test on outside and others have said we can't do anything so it, it's clearly very tricky uh, and that is the current situation I think really. Yeah and, and what, are the, what are the kind of data to show that there is actual harm in using steroids so for instance if we have an acute uh, synovitis big swollen knee to give 40 milligrams defamedrone in a safe environment, would you consider that to be uh, correct treatment, or you know, are the risks too great? Yeah, it's look, it's it, obviously it's it's a balance. If if people can't walk around because the pain in the knee is so so terrible, uh, to try to do uh, uh, an aspiration and injection, you know, becomes it becomes important. Uh, clearly, it would have to be done with the usual restrictions that we know about so well now. Would, would be important to do as well. Uh, I, I clearly. Patients have as said, tended to avoid coming to hospital, but where they are desperate, I think you, you have to take a balanced view. Uh, and if the patient is, is willing to take the it is something of risk, I guess, to come to hospital, have it done, then I guess you have to go with that. Uh, so I don't think there's a huge risk of having a, an aspiration and a steroid injection at this point, provided it can be done as safely as possible. Mm. And which of the um, DMODs that we use, disease modifying agents, are kind of less? Well, you mentioned sulfasalazine and hydroxychloroquine are not actually immune suppressant at all. I think that's the drift of it. Um, where would you put methotrexate? Okay, so methotrexate is very interesting. Uh, the first use of, of methotrexate in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis goes back to 1951. Uh, and like many uh, drugs uh, of this type, uh, these drugs started life as drugs being used by the oncologists in much, much higher doses. Uh, and the use of methotrexate became popularized uh, in the UK in the 1970s and subsequently in the 1980s. Uh, and now it's widely agreed to be, as you know, a very effective drug in the treatment of rheumatoid. Uh, how exactly it is working is a matter of some debate. And there's been a lot of uh, interest in the, in the States uh, that, um, sorry, keep getting calls here. Uh, uh, a lot of interest in the States uh, that methotrexate may not be working as a classic immunosuppressive, but rather as a drug which uh, works in some other way, which shamefully we don't actually know. Mm. So it is curious that a drug that's been around for 60 years may be working in, in a slightly different way to that that was postulated for many years. Nevertheless, most people seem to assume that it has some degree of immunosuppression. Uh, and so the, the, the advice would be that that's one that you perhaps, especially in these Montes Mondrick, is that you wouldn't start just now, but you try to sort of delay it for a little mm. while. Same thing as the therapy, which obviously needs blood test monitoring and definitely the cyclophosphate and mycophenolate, which clearly do need blood test monitoring. And so choose the, the, the safer options if you can, sulfasalazine, hydroxychloroquine. Absolutely. absolutely. Yes. And um, what about anti-TNF agents? First question, risk of infections using anti-TNF agents in rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. And okay, so as I think is well established, the first three months and to some extent the first six months are clearly uh, uh, the most dangerous points uh, for patients being started on biologic drugs. Uh, and that's why we tended to avoid doing that at UCH. I suspect many others have done the same thing. Uh, the increased risk becomes much smaller uh, subsequent to six months. It's not zero. Uh, so patients on biologic drugs have a slightly increased risk, so they should certainly be staying uh, you know, well, well hidden, I would say. Uh, so we wouldn't start a patient currently on, on, a, uh, on a biologic drug currently, but we hope that in the next two or three weeks that, that, that advice may change a little bit. Great. Um, just to go into, we'll finish off with this uh, respiratory complications associated with rheumatoid arthritis. Yep. Um, so if, uh, how's that going to impact on uh, diagnostically, say, with a COVID patient? So how would you distinguish between interstitial pneumonitis due to methotrexate, let's say, or um, due to rheumatoid itself or scleroderma and the COVID presentation in the chest? Uh, so in some cases, it probably could be tricky. Uh, I, I suspect uh, that the numbers of patients have where this is going to be a true diagnostic dilemma it will be small uh, because with methotrexate, the numbers of patients who get significant interstitial disease because of the drug is probably 1% or less. 
So I, th I would hope that that would be a, a fairly uh, minor matter, but there could be cases where it could be a little bit difficult. I guess you have to go on the history, clearly. Uh, and if it is feasible uh, and you can get a chest x-ray, that may give you a little bit of an inkling. Uh, so a, a slightly challenging issue uh, and, and not one that's completely easy to resolve um, uh, over the phone. Certainly that would be very difficult, I think. Yeah. Um, and TNF Alpha in frontline health workers, should they be shielding? So some of our colleagues will, will be on anti-TNFs. And other yes, yes. I, I, I personally think that probably would be sensible. Uh, so yes, I think I would say yes to that. Okay, great. Um, shall we move forward and look at um, treatments um, which have been used in rheumatology diseases for years um, and now are finding a purpose in uh, COVID because COVID seems to have a second phase of illness, which is a, a huge cytokine release uh, syndrome. Uh, there are many other um, ways of uh, describing it, but basically there's a huge cytokine release, which actually does the organ damage. So that damages the lungs, kidneys, heart. Um, and there are some drugs that we've been using for other diseases. Um, so SLE being, lupus being one of them, uh, diseases such as rheumatoid. Um, how do we look at, it's quite interesting to look at the parallels here because we've got a, a long track record of looking at those diseases with the cytokine release syndrome and how are people taking it up into the covid arena so a very important question not least because as uh, as everybody will know uh, the search for a vaccine and the demonstration that one is effective is going to go on for many months uh, and of course remember that not every viral infection uh, have we been able to develop a vaccine for hiv being the classic example and even if you look at the different forms of vaccination, some have been very successful, for example, in smallpox, some are less successful as in influenza. So I suppose that in terms of repurposed drugs, hydroxychloroquine is the one which immediately comes to mind. Uh, there was a great deal of interest in a paper that was published uh, soon after the lockdown by uh, Didier Raoult in, in uh, Marseille. That study is very flawed. Uh, it was principally interested in collecting PCR data. Uh, and the secondary endpoint data, the clinical studies, were not released uh, in, in, the, in, in the publication, as far as I could see it anyway. And yet these were very important. They were collecting information, apparently, on the time to apyrexia, uh, the time to normalization of the respiratory rate, length of hospital stay, mortality. And this was a study of just 26 patients uh, that were, uh, who were collected in one centre in Marseille with just 16 controls who were collected from other clinics. Um, it's very odd, really. There were some very odd adjustments. Certain patients removed from the study. Some data points seem to be guessed at rather than, than, than really collected adequately. Uh, the paper was peer reviewed, apparently less than 24 hours. And the editor in chief of the journal is a junior colleague of, uh, of the senior investigator on the trial. So lots of very uh, dodgy um, cons well, lots of concerns really about that study. Uh, Clearly, we await larger studies which are being done in China. And as you probably know, Stephanie, uh, hydroxychloroquine is one of the arms of the recovery study. It's a big study going on in the UK, which is comparing the use of hydroxychloroquine with the use of a couple of HIV drugs, uh, lopidavir and ritinavir, also low-dose dexamethasone, also azithromycin, and also tocilizumab. Now, worthwhile pointing out that a paper has been published from China in the last week or two in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, looking at the use of lopinavar and ritinavar, HIV drugs. No clinical benefit was shown in a study of 199 patients. Um, the combination that um, uh, the people in Marseille had proposed was of course of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, but again not much evidence that that's really going to be effective here. The story with tocilizumab is, of course, very interesting for the reasons that you've outlined, which is the question of the cytokine storm. Now, cytokine storms obviously involve more than one cytokine, and uh, Jess Manson and uh, Pooja um, Mehta put it out in their letter in The Lancet quite recently that cytokine storms clearly involve a number of different cytokines, um, IL-1, IL-6 perhaps, um, and TNF-alpha. Uh, and it's perhaps worthwhile reflecting that the TNF alpha drugs, which were kind of celebrating their 20th birthdays, really. Uh, so these were introduced initially for septic shock and uh, didn't really work very well there. Uh, so whether they're going to work here, we can't be sure about. Uh, tocilizumab, I, I should uh, confess to a couple of personal uh, interests. So the importance of IL-6 and the IL-6 receptor was pointed out by Kishimoto in Japan. 
And uh, Kishimoto is an interesting guy. I, I know that partly because I've met him, partly because uh, I have a distant relation who worked for him for 10 years. Uh, and uh, uh, he, it was his small Japanese company which first developed uh, tocilizumab. Uh, and they did a small clinical trial uh, just over 22, 23 years ago. And they came to Gabriel Panay, who was then the professor of rheumatology at Guy's. And they asked Gabriel and I to do the first trial of tocilizumab in rheumatoid patients outside of Japan. Uh, and we did that with the help of um, uh, Johnny Arno uh, from, from uh, UCH and uh, Ernest Choi was then at Guy's. And we published that paper about 18, 19 years ago. So I've been very interested in tocilizumab for a very long time. Uh, and it does seem that it might have a role to play here. But again, the recovery trial is very important here. We, we need to get the results of that to know if it's really going to be effective. Uh, there have also been proposals that drug um, uh, remdesivir which is an anti ebola drug, might, be, might have a part to play. So lots of balls in the air, I would say, but at the moment, we don't have any certainty. There's one particular aspect to, uh, of, of, of um, Corona to emphasize, and that's the patients uh, who develop the HLH uh, syndrome. Uh, Jess Manson has been leading a, a national group on this, and of course we have uh, established treatments for this uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis disease. Uh, and a kinra is being used, uh, some steroids have been used, a topicide has been used, like sporin has been used, IVIG is being used, uh, and this is being, uh, these drugs are being applied in those patients. Uh, the total numbers of patients with HLH uh, complicating corona, difficult to say, but I suspect it'll be less than uh, 5% or maybe around the 5 to 10% figure. Uh, but again, that's going to come out as, as more data is, is accrued. So, uh, as I say, lots of balls in the air, but just we lack really good clinical trial data at the moment. Hopefully that will come through shortly. And when do you think we might see the first results? Because they're expediting everything at the moment, aren't they? So when uh, do you think? Yeah, you're right. Everything's sort of on, on sort of speed dial, but uh, uh, exactly when stuff is going to come out, that's very hard to say. I, I suspect it'll be months rather than weeks, but uh, clearly in China, things have been going on for rather longer. So we may get some results out of China rather sooner. And do you think on compassionate grounds, people might use tocilizumab, let's say, for a cytokine storm if somebody's progressing into that second phase of uh, disease activation of the lungs etc which uh, is terribly difficult to control and not very well treated by ventilation do you think on compassionate grounds people might be using that uh, I, I suspect they probably are uh, I, I can't quote you chapter and verse uh, but but I suspect that you could make a quite a good case for it. And obviously it's a drug which has been widely available. Uh, so it's not as if you're gonna to have to sort of uh, uh, recreate it, it's there. Uh, and uh, certainly the, plots, the supplies were reasonably plentiful before this all started. Uh, quite how they're doing now, I, I can't tell you for sure. Um, and there was a comment from one of the um, health uh, managers, I think it was, that, that these drugs are extremely expensive, but they're not going to be used in long term. This is the point. They've, so, for instance, tocilizumab would be used as two um, injections, let's say, and then that would be it. So it's to interrupt a cycle. It's not a long term use as for rheumatoid or something like that, I imagine. Well, absolutely. And also, if clearly if you get patients out of the intensive care units, uh, uh, that will also, uh, in terms of simple financing, be a, a huge saving as well, I suspect. So, yes, I agree with you. Yes. And then just one or two of the questions. So somebody's asked, well, in vasculitis, organ-threatening disease, would you still commence cyclophosphamide or would you reduce doses? Uh, yeah, that's a very, a very good question and a very difficult question to answer. It, it's, as I said, right at the start, it's always going to be a question of balance. If you've got a patient whose life is threatened, then I think you're just going to have to take the chance. You try to do it in the safest possible way. Uh, one point about cyclophosphamide that people recognize now is that uh, until about 15, 20 years ago, the recognized regimes for the NIH, uh, which incorporates, incorporates cyclophosphamide, use much larger doses than we do now. So the original regime for lupus and arthritis, for example, incorporated a gram of cyclophosphide every month for six months and every three months for two years. And now we know from the really fantastic work done by the European Lupus Group that 500 milligrams fortnightly times six, so three grams instead of 15, is as safe and it's an awful lot better in terms of side effects. So with patients presenting with vasculitis, you could envisage that uh, uh, cyclophosphide or possibly rituximab would be useful. But again, one has to be mindful of the concerns about reduction in IgG levels and increased risk of infection. So it's a very balanced view that you have to take, not easy decisions. And you have to decide this on a case-by-case -case basis, I think.
Yeah. And then uh, asking about testing. I mean, how is that going? Bearing in mind, we will get testing in future about um, antibody status. But we've got acute testing at the moment. Um, to see if someone's got COVID live, as it were. But in the future, the antibody tests, uh, they do seem to be kind of all over the place at the moment. But I think they will come into line fairly soon, I hope. And how can you see those being used around our immune suppressive drugs, when to restart DMARDs, when to restart anti-TNFs, let's say? Well, there, you're right. There are said to be dozens of uh, companies around the world who are desperately trying to develop uh, effective and uh, fast antibody tests. And we clearly, there will be need to establish what your status is. Uh, and clearly it has been, this country has been rather slow in developing the tests or the testing uh, to determine whether or not the the, uh, the COVID is present uh, in a, an acute situation uh, compared to countries like Germany, for example, which is maybe one of the rasons why the German rate of mortality is much lower than, than ours. Uh, so yes, we, so we need antibody tests to be up and running as fast as possible uh, and determining exactly how the, the timing of these tests and the, and the introduction of the, uh, of the drugs uh, then becomes uh, was an interesting, quite challenging problem. Uh, and I don't think we have any simple answers to that at the moment. First of all, we need to get the tests available. And then I think we can work out the answers after that. Yes. <laughs> um, do you see, ch this is about outpatient setting. So obviously it's been quite interesting doing outpatient um, interviews by Zoom, whatever. Um, do you see, I, I heard another health manager the other day saying, well, this will be the end of outpatients and we won't need to see patients in outpatients anymore. Um, for our specialty in particular, because we've got to examine, um, you've got to examine and, and put together the clinical signs. I'd say that was fairly impossible. I mean, I can see a lot of cases that might be follow-ups and therefore um, could be done on the telephone. But I think for initial diagnostics, you'd need to see the patient. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. And I'll, I'll give you an example of, of the importance of that. The very last uh, clinic that I did with face-to-face -face patients, uh, I saw a delightful American lady uh, who had a classic history of gout. And I remember I had three other brothers who had gout. Uh, and I did a general examination. And on general examination, she had a heart murmur. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was unaware of that. And I passed it you know, uh, wish had nobody mentioned this to her before. She said, well, no, but she said, I'm glad you mentioned it because... I know, I should confess to you, I've had some palpitations in the last uh, two or three weeks, which I haven't told anybody about. Uh, now, we had a cardiologist around the corner, so I was able to, to sort of get the, the cardiological show on the road, but without actually examining that patient, uh, you know, you would never have known. And we do face this, this horrible paradox that, um, you know, just because there's a pandemic going on doesn't mean that people aren't going to get cancer, acute rheumatoid arthritis, flares of the lupus, whatever. And we're having to work within a system which is trying to manage both of these, these kinds of broad scale issues uh, simultaneously. And it's very difficult. Several patients have made it crystal clear to me that they have very little interest in coming to hospital either for a routine or especially for a research appointment in the next few months. And I, I can understand that. But the point that you make is, is very important. I think in the end, nothing quite beats I mean, history taking was vital, but you have to examine your patients, I think, to determine more precisely uh, what is going on so that you can come to a more accurate diagnosis. So I, I think your health manager is wrong. I, I think uh, there is a continuing need to actually see patients. As you say, with some patients who've been, you know, you might have been seeing for 10 or 20 years and you see them every six months. I think if they miss an appointment, it probably will not be the end of the world. But certainly for the newer patients, uh, especially for those that you're thinking about putting onto main mainline drugs, you're going to need to do that, not least because with our rheumatoids, for example, clearly we have to do joint counts in order to, to satisfy uh, the reg regulatory uh, requests, uh, uh, demands before we can actually start patients on biologic drugs. So we have to see them. So no, I think there will be a continuing need to see patients, but I think there will be resistance on the part of a number of patients about coming into hospital. Mm. And how has it in general affected your large lupus cohort? Uh, so you're, you're, you've been doing Zoom consultations or telephone consultations. Do you feel as though they're adequate? How do the patients feel about that? Uh, I think for the patients that we've seen for a long time who are in remission or near remission on stable doses of low doses of steroids, hydroxychloroquine, et cetera, that's fine-ish. Uh, the real challenges come, and as I mentioned earlier on, with patients who've sat at home for the last three or four weeks clearly flaring, not wanting to come into hospital, 
And finally, the disease gets flares, gets to be so bad, they come in as an emergency. And as I mentioned, we have a couple in the intensive care unit. So it, it's, it's tricky um, with, with some patients, and especially with new referrals. What do you do about new referrals when you're doing it over the phone? It's very profoundly unsatisfactory, actually. Uh, and we have a number of, of um, patients where we've been asked to provide a second opinion. And, and again, it's very difficult to do that in, in the present circumstances. Uh, from what one hears, it seems like there will be a, a, a slackening off of the um, uh, of these very strict rules in the course of the next, let's say, three or four weeks. And I would hope that we'll be able to see a few more face-to-face -face patients. Uh, our department, I suspect many others too, have, have uh, set up uh, emergency clinic days uh, and times so that we can get patients seen uh, in, the, in the cases of real emergency and, and patients do come up to that situation, uh, that, that I hope will become a lot easier in the course of the next month or so. But uh, these have been some very, very difficult times, an ongoingly difficult time, not just for lupus patients, but for acute rheumatoids, vasculitis patients too. And, and do you see us using face masks in the clinic and social distancing, you know, the two metres? Do you see that happening? For uh, the well, well, person, I, having been sort of banned from the hospital for the last four weeks, I, I haven't seen that <laughs> very much myself. But uh, I, I am told that that is going on. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So yeah, uh, there was a very interesting um, RSM talk about face masks. Very pro, actually. So I noticed Nicola Sturgeon is also <laughs> pro face masks. So, there we go. And the Germans. Yeah. You know, most most other countries. <laughs> yeah. So I can see that happening. Um, so uh, if you sum it up would you say we need we need testing we need the antibody test to feel a little bit more safe about it carry on doing what we're doing uh, but choose the the less immune suppressant uh dmards rather than the more immune suppressants uh try and avoid steroids but if necessary you do have to use steroids would you say that's a fair yeah, I think that's a fair summary. Uh, from the point of view of testing, I think it's probably true that maybe as many as 50% of the people in rheumatology at UCH have probably had the virus, uh, but, but, but very few have been able to actually get the test to, to know for sure. Mm. I think the, the greater availability of testing for acute infection is important. Uh, the development of antibody tests is, is, I think, very, very important. And ultimately, uh, hopefully we will get a vaccine, but that's, that's a long, long way away, I suspect. Yes, and we didn't mention remdesivir, did we? Just just one HIV drug which has uh, been used. Is, uh, I think you touched on it in the recovery trial, didn't you? But that, that's right. Uh, it, it's it's been studied in one Chinese uh, study uh, and without much effect. Oh, okay, that's a shame. <laughs> yeah, and how far away do you think we are from a vaccine from your contacts? Oh, I, I think uh, well, as, as you know, the the trial started in Oxford, uh, and uh, it would be fa fabulous if that turned out to be successful because it could change the whole dynamic of how we manage this subsequently. Because I think uh, that even if the strict lockdown is is ended in three or four weeks' time, whatever, clearly this is going to be an ongoing thing. And I think personally. Uh, from the hospital perspective, it will probably be at least a year before we are we are back to anything really really close to normality. I mean, UCH, the ultrasound department, for example, was closed. It's just beginning to open up for emergency uh, ultrasound scans, and I assume the same sort of thing is going on hospitals around around the country. But I, I think the re the return to normality is going to be over months, not, not weeks. Yeah, and we've also just to kind of almost finish up. We've got. Um, Kawasaki type um, presentations yeah. in children. Yeah. Um, any comments about that? Uh, mercifully seems to be very rare, uh, 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 but intriguing. Uh, I think the whole story of, of uh, what corona can do to human beings is, is gradually emerging. Uh, but you're right, this, this, this was highlighted yesterday by Matt Hancock in his, in his, in his talk. Uh, and certainly Kawasaki disease, very sinister and serious in children and, uh, and requires very careful attention to, 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 to detail management, clearly. And slightly different drugs, I think, isn't it? A high dose aspirin and what else do they do? They use anti TNFs. What's what's their? Uh, I, I'm not the best person to tell you about that, as I've seen some of the data. Sorry, <laughs> IVIG. I think. Yeah, yeah. IVIG. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I think those are the key ones. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. Is there anything else you would like to say to the audience about you know sort of summing up what? Uh, no, I think. 
well, clearly we, we are living in, in remarkable times. As I said right at the start, it's like, like living in a history book. Uh, and I'm sure we will look back on these days and, and, uh, and, and, and remark that, you know, which of us would have thought three, four, five, six months ago that anything like this would be happening. It's been just incredible. Uh, but uh, my thanks to all my colleagues, uh, uh, not just my own department, but around the country who are dealing with patients with very challenging uh, diseases, very challenging decisions to make. Uh, and, and thanks for inviting me to come and join you today, Stephanie. Well, thank you very much, David, spending your valuable time with us. Yeah, back to songwriting. <laughs> <laughs> All the best. Thank you.